um, as I was driving here today, I thought, you know what? I could have actually titled the sermon today, The Precious Blood of Jesus Part Two, you know, from what Pastor Peter preached uh, last week. And, um, because that's what really the core of what today's sermon is also about, the gospel, the precious blood of Christ. And, um, how many of you guys know uh, what Tuesday night was? It started Tuesday night and ended Wednesday night. Anybody know? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. What is Yom Kippur? You might know it better from Leviticus 16 called the Day of Atonement. And Yom Kippur was a very, very special day. It happened once a year. And only one person can enter a very special place called the Holy of Holies. And much preparation had to be done. And if you didn't follow God's law and God's rule, and you entered at the wrong time, or whenever you wanted to, you would literally be struck dead. The Holy of Holies was the most sacred place because that was the place where the presence of God rested here. God is omniscient, but specifically, there was something very special in there called the Ark. And the top of the Ark was a very special place called Mercy Seat. And every year, the high priest had to follow very specific directions. First, they had to slay a bull as a sin offering for the high priest and his household. Then they had to take two goats. One of the goats we know as the scapegoat. The high priest had to lay his hands on the goat. Symbolizing the transference of all the sin. And the goat was led out, banished into the wilderness, symbolizing the separation and banishment of sin from the presence of God. Then the second goat was taken and it, the blood was also shed as a sin offering. And the high priest was to carry that blood of the bull and the goat on the day of atonement. Go to the mercy seat, which represented the presence of God, and sprinkle the blood as atonement for the sins of Israel. Now we we learned last week from Pastor Peter from Leviticus 17, 11, where it says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. And have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. And unless you understand Leviticus 16, you will never understand what the great high priest, Jesus' role as the great high priest, really was. And today, uh, before we dive into Isaiah 6, which I believe is just another form of the gospel. I want you to take just a moment of silence and think, you know, as you sit here, worshiping our Lord together, studying his word, think about what is the greatest need that you have right now? Pause and think for a moment. What is the greatest need In our fallenness, in our sinfulness, in our pride, you know, maybe you had to oh, oh, my greatest need is my spouse to be a little bit more spiritual. Or my greatest need is to, to reconcile this broken relationship. My greatest need is all finance. My business isn't doing too well. 
or my something related to my, or maybe your greatest need is something related to your children. The need you have related to your children or a family member. But I want to propose to you today that sometimes the things we think are our greatest needs are all symptoms. of a sinful world and our greatest need is actually according to the pattern that we see in Isaiah 6 something very different I want to propose that by studying Isaiah 6 that we can see that our greatest need is to turn our eyes to Jesus to see him for who he is to fall in our knees in repentance, and then to be restored by the touch of Jesus. Let's all rise and let's read Isaiah 6, 1 through 8 together. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then when the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hands, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. There is a pattern here in Isaiah that's repeated in, in many times in the Bible. When God deals with someone, and it always goes like this. God reaches down and he shows sinful people who he really is. And here, in Isaiah's case, he gives him a vision of the holiness of God. He gives him a vision of the throne. God shows us a little bit, a glimpse of his glory of his beauty, of his holiness. And then the very next step, whenever this happens, something immediately naturally follows. It's the conviction of our sin. When you stand next to someone who is holy, all of a sudden, our own lives, which we thought were not too bad, better than most, all of a sudden it looks so inadequate, looks so dirty, looks so sinful. Now, I'm the son of a printer. And so I learned about paper early on. So I always like to use this analogy. I think I've shared it before, but I'll share it because it's so applicable. You know, paper brightness, numbers, Go from about 80 to 100. If you take regular copy paper and buy it from office people, the brightness there is about 80. And if you look at it by itself, this is an 80 brightness paper. It looks white. Only if you don't compare it to the 100 brightness paper, which is much more expensive, but you put a 100 brightness paper next to an 80 brightness paper, and the 80 brightness all of a sudden starts to look it doesn't look white anymore. You can tell, wait a minute, if this is white, this can't be white. 
And this is what happens to Isaiah. Notice that the sin that Isaiah has been carrying, it's a pattern, it's been with him all his life, but he never felt like, oh, the need to repent. But only when he saw the Lord. When he stopped comparing himself to others. Others probably thought he was a very holy man, a very godly man. And probably treated him with the highest respect. But all human views of himself were shattered when he stood next to or saw the image of the Holy God. And the only thing he could do is say, Woe is me. From a man of Woe is me. I'm like a dead man because me, a sinful person, has seen the Holy God. There is a passage of scripture in Exodus 33 when Moses was seeing his people in. And Moses was always talking with the Lord. And one day Moses asked, Lord, show me your glory. And you know what God says? I told him, you don't know what you're asking. I can't do that. He says, you can't see my face. No man can see me and live. Holiness and sinfulness cannot mix. God is so holy that if we as sinful people at Versailles face, we would be killed in an instant apart from the blood of the Lamb. And you know what we said last week? Saying, no, I can't wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? As we talked about the precious blood of Jesus. But what's all this? After Isaiah is convicted of his sin, it says there's a seraphim, the same seraphim who was. Flying around with two wings, with two wings covering his face, with two wings covering his feet at the holiness of Jesus. Maybe the seraphim couldn't see the holiness of God either. That's why his face was covered. And the feet are most lowly and most symbolizing the dirtiest part. It's also covered in the presence of the Lord. Comes around and goes to the altar, takes tongs of burning coal and brings it and touches the lips of Isaiah. This is highly symbolic. In, in, in any visions, there's many visions of the throne room in the Bible, but there, there's usually two things. The throne, which represents the place where God is worshipped and His holiness is revered. And the throne is there for God, but there's also something else that's there for us. You know what that is? That's the altar. And it's by the altar that allows us to have our sins forgiven and be in the presence of God. The altar is there for the sin sacrifice. And if you understand Jesus as the great high priest, you can understand that everything that was done in the Old Testament was there to show us what Jesus would eventually do. After Isaiah is convicted of his sin, God doesn't say, I'm so glad God doesn't say, you're right. Sorry. You are super sinful. Get away from my presence. You don't belong here. God doesn't do that. He takes, he tells a seraphim to go take a fiery coal. You know what seraphim means? It's very interesting. It's, it's only used in Isaiah 6 in the entire Bible. It's used nowhere else. And it comes from the Hebrew with seraph, which means to burn. So seraphim are literally fiery ones. That's what, that's what seraphim means. The fiery ones. It's plural for seraph. It means fiery ones. And what the seraphim does when he takes the coal is highly symbolic of, of what? Jesus, the great high priest, would 
It's not the coal that forgives sins in the Old Testament. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you understand the great high priest and what Jesus did, which is explained in the book of Hebrews, you would see this. Hebrews 6, 19-20 says, We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where the forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf and he has become a high priest forever. You see, the Day of Atonement, when the priest had to do all that, all that was pointing to Jesus and what he would do. And you remember what happened to the Holy of Holies when Jesus was on that cross? As Jesus' own flesh was being torn, the curtain at the temple was also from top to bottom being torn. What was the curtain representative of? It was represented, it was the shield. The holiness of God was blocked by the curtain so the sinful people would not be killed. So what Jesus did, what the gospel is, and as he, his flesh was being torn on the cross, the curtain itself was being torn. The separation between sinful man and God was being removed. Um, I don't have time to go over this, but write down Hebrews 9, 11 through 15 and read that again. That clearly explains Jesus, the great high priest, and, and what is happening here. All the symbolism of, of the mercy seat and all. Because it really explains in Hebrews 9 that, that it was really Jesus who went to the tabernacle of heaven, the greater tabernacle, and performed once and for all the duties of a high priest, which was to satisfy a holy God. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own precious blood. It's only after God has taken us through steps one through three that we can finally say to God and respond in obedience to Him. Notice that it's God who shows us who He is. Notice that it's God who convicts of sin. Notice it's God who touches and restores. And only after God has done all those three can we say in surrender, inspired by the beauty of the one who shed his blood for us. Here I am, Lord. Your Lord, I'm your servant. Do as you will, I will follow. Isn't that what a disciple is? You know, there's many ways as a parent to get your kids to do what you want them to do. My father had one way and my mom had another when I was growing up. For my father, it was do what I say or I'll break your legs. Literally, I mean, he said that to me many times. I remember one day I wanted to, uh, I lived on Western uh, and Melrose, and, and I wanted, and I used to walk to an arcade. And one day I, I told my dad I wanted to go there, and I said, If you go there, I'm going to break your legs. I didn't go 
later that day, you know, uh, because of fear. Some parents use guilt. They try to pry on the guilt of your heart to get you to do things. They try to manipulate. But I love my mom so much because she didn't use any of those tactics. She was love. She loved us so self-sacrificially. And I would do anything for my mom. When my dad passed away, it was very, very different. He passed away about three years ago. It was very, very different than when my mom passed away. He passed away last year. So many more tears were shed when my mom passed away. Because I remember all the displays of love that made me who I am today. I love to tell this story. It's, they call it the pear story, but whenever I think of my mom, I think of this pear. When I was little, one of the things, we were very poor. My father was a professor in Korea, but when we moved to the United States, he thought he could get a job. He thought he knew English, but it was all book English, and his accent was so thick, nobody understood what he was saying. And the only jobs he could get was like janitorial and things like that, and it drove him nuts. And it made him very angry, because he could no longer support the family. It was my mom who supported all of us. And when we were in the market, then we didn't have much. And back then, Asian pears were extremely rare and extremely expensive. I don't know if you remember. And we would beg and plead and beg and plead. Can we buy one of these, please? And my mom, my mom was gay then, it's okay, you can buy one. But the problem was there's five of us. What are you gonna do with one pair with five people? And I remember how my mom so delicately cut that it into five or well, four pieces and gave all of us the best pieces and while she just sucked on the core. I remember my mom when my dad finally started a printing business, how she worked so hard that every one of her fingers, her all her fingerprints were worn out. She had a band-aid, 10 band-aids for 10 fingers because she was manually collating paper and doing work only that a machine could have done. Never and that kind of love inspires. It changes people. It changed us as her children. And I believe that God, when He wants the best for us, He motivates us not through guilt. He motivates us not through fear. When the Bible talks about fear, it's very different than the fear we understand. It's more like awe and reverence, and it's one day we should do a study on that. Um, but he inspires us. With the most powerful motivator of all, love. Right? Think about when you were in love. I know for some of us it's been a long time. Uh, I lived in Orange County, my wife lived in Arcadia, and her dad was very strict. He didn't like me very much at the beginning. He didn't want his daughter to be taken away by somebody who wanted to be a missionary and take them out of the country and all that other stuff. And he was very against it. And he put a curfew of 9 p.m. when <laughs> we were out of things. And sometimes I would drive all the way from Orange County to Arcadia, and our favorite place in the back then, Disneyland annual passes were what, like $99, I don't know if you remember. And then for one whole year, you could buy an annual parking permit for a whole year for $35. And so we would go and they, you know, at the happiest place on earth, and I would do so much driving, but we would only be able to spend a couple hours and then I could drive all the way back and then drive all the way back. And, you know, sometimes I would spend through traffic, you know, sometimes it would take four hours in the car and just a couple hours at this and that. But who cares? I wasn't thinking about that. I was in love. I was motivated by something else. And that's the motivation by which God wants to motivate us as 
we live, you know, and not by guilt. We should do this because the Bible said, if you don't, don't you? You're guilty. I brought this rope from my garage because I wanted to try to illustrate something. And I'm not smart enough to have thought of this by myself. I, I saw Francis Chan do this once and I was so touched by it. I was like, I'm going to copy that. So I shamelessly borrowed it from Francis Chan. But can you, can you take this and take it all the way as far as you can? <laughs> this is a long rope. <laughs> It's time, okay, well, let's just stop. Just pretend it's going on for eternity. Okay, thank you. You could drop it in. I wasn't supposed to tangle it. It was supposed to go all the way to the entrance. A little piece of duct tape on this rope. You know what this represents? If this is our life, our timeline of our life, this little piece of duct tape represents a time you are a drop in the bucket. And God pleads with us. In this short time, God wants to train us and prepare us for all eternity. He doesn't need us. He could do a far better job. of sharing the gospel throughout the world. He's using his angels in a heartbeat in one night. And it's been over 2,000 years. We're so bad at our job. After 2,000 years, we still haven't done it. But in this short span, God wants us to invest in the things that are eternal. He wants us to be motivated by love for what he did for us on the mercy seat. He wants to inspire us to live lives. The best, the best way I can say is washing our lives. I don't know. Maybe, I don't speak for him very well, but some words sometimes you just have to use it in Korea. And God is calling us and asking us, will you give up your small ambition? But so many of us are like the rich young ruler. I, I have so much. I have status here. I, I, I've gone to a really good college. I have all these degrees. I live very well here on this earth. How can I give that up? Just like the rich young ruler. You know that word? We're probably the top one percent of financially when you compare us to the population of the world. We are the rich young ruler. Are we going to be satisfied with that? My greatest fear. As in the end, when the Bible talks about all the people who come to him and say, Lord, I did this for you, I did that for you. I'm here, Lord. And the Lord looks at them and says, I never knew you. These are people who thought they were followers of Christ serving the Lord. That's scary to me. Let me close with this. You know, wisdom. Shall we spend all our efforts and energy preparing for this? Or shall we store up our treasure in heaven? Prepare for eternity. Um, central truth. Our greatest need today, when we look at the book of Isaiah, is to turn our eyes on Jesus, fall on our knees in repentance, and to be restored by his touch. 
so that we can go forth. The people we meet every day in our sphere of influence is work. Maybe it's just our children. Maybe it's our neighbors as talking to them as we water our grass. Maybe whoever it may be. And if we met the Lord, we would just radiate His presence. This process happens all the time throughout the Bible. Do you remember what happened uh, to Peter? Luke 5, 8, the first time he meets Jesus, what, what is he doing? Luke 5, he, he was fishing all night and he caught absolutely nothing, right? And then there's this carpenter, you know? He goes, oh, you caught nothing? Why don't you try it again? Why don't you go do it over there? Carpenter telling fishermen how to fish. Now think about that. It's like if you're a pharmacist, some sociologist major is telling you about medicines and trying to explain medicines to you. But for some strange reason, Peter listens to the sociologist, no, to the carpenter. And he tries it again. And then what does he say? The boat immediately starts to sink because there's too many fish. And he knows he fished all night. He knows there wasn't supposed to be any fish there. They're doing it at the wrong time, the wrong way, the wrong place. And yet, the boat is sinking because there's too many. So he called the second boat. Then what does Peter say? He goes, this is a thank you. Wow, amazing. What's your name? No, he doesn't say that. He knows that this is impossible. He knows that the person standing in front of him isn't just a carpenter. He gets a glimpse of God's glory. What does he do? What was me? I'm a man of unclean lips. Or another way of saying, get away from me, for I'm a sinful man. And then what happens? He spends three years with Jesus. He starts to see Jesus' beauty. He starts to see. Jesus' is love and compassion. He starts to see divinity incarnate. And after he's been touched by Jesus, then what happens? After Jesus has been crucified and he rises again, Jesus is on the beach and he looks out to his disciples. And what are his disciples doing? They're fishing. It seems it must have not been very good fishing because every time the Bible talks about it, they don't catch any fish. They caught nothing. They're, they're having a hard time. And all of suggest, if, if you look, Jesus yells out and says, he, he specifically says, little children, you didn't catch anything, did you? Look at John 21, 7. He calls out to his disciples, you didn't catch any fish, right? And the same thing happens. Catch a fish. And the disciple that Jesus loved all of a sudden says, Oh my gosh, look, it's Jesus. It's the Master. But this time, look at the response of Peter. What does he do? He can't wait for the boat to get to the beach. So he dives into the water to swim, to get to Jesus as fast as he can. He's been touched by the master. What would we live for? I used to think that repentance was only when I messed up, when I got in a fight with my wife. And I got angry or I did something, I said something I should have. Or when I violated some of the things in my own heart that I knew was wrong and I fell into the desires of then I need to go and repent. I thought it was based on okay, certain actions I did physically, then I would go repent. But you know what? As I get to know the Bible more, I realized that all of my life is about repentance. All of this entire Bible is about the gospel, both Old Testament and New. Because my heart is sinful. 
Yes, I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. But until the day of glorification, my heart is still selfish and sinful. And I need to fight every day. And the greatest sins I need to repent of are not some acts necessarily that I've committed in terms of physical acts. But it's an act of the heart where I place myself above God. Where I say with my mouth, Jesus is Lord, but in my heart I'm not Lord. Where I love to talk about being a servant, but when I'm treated like a servant, I get angry. And here Isaiah tells us what we need most. Every single one of us, every single day. We need to see the beauty and the glory and the holiness of Jesus. We need to fall on our knees in repentance. We need to allow the touch of the Holy Spirit to transform our simple hearts day by day, moment by moment, second by second. And only then will we be able to go out to this world. Let me just go through the whole pictures. This is the Lucy River. I talked about this before, but I thought I'd show you some visual images. The highest concentration of unreached people groups are here. And that water is foul and filthy. It's not the ocean, it's dirty. It has a, a, an incredibly awful stench. And the first time I went there, I was so shocked because, you know, when you ask where the bathroom is, they point to a plank. Think of a plank on a pirate ship, but yet they put a piece of wood, uh, next photo, if, next photo, next, okay, I'm just gonna stop right there for a second. And they put a plank out into the wood, and, and like a pirate ship, you go out there, but instead of jumping off, you squat and you go to the bathroom right into the river. It just falls right into the river. The interesting thing is, like right down, you see children playing in that water, you see people bathing in that water, you see people brushing their teeth in that water. Next photo. But in that place, you have these incredibly beautiful people who've never heard who Jesus is, never heard about the gospel. And we use the library ministry to go and visit those villages. And at the same time, we bring crafts and arts and crafts, and we have incredible times. My, my children have never been to Hawaii, but they've been here. And the price of going to Hawaii, the price of going here is all about the same. <laughs> But 10 times out of 10, I would choose to take my family here. Why? Because of this. There's no greater joy than knowing that you're investing in eternity. What's wiser? So putting all your chips right here when you know eternity is there. God is calling us to be a people who humble ourselves before the Lord every single day, to see his beauty and his holiness, to come to him in a posture of repentance, knowing that our own hearts, although we are saved, keep wanting to go against what God commands. And it's not a one-time deal, it's a daily coming to the altar, a daily being reminded of the blood that was shed and a daily going out into this dark world that so desperately needs Jesus and being salt and light. Let's go to God.